The Heinemann Podcast is a production of Heinemann Publishing. Heinemann is a provider of resources written by real teachers for real classrooms. Heinemann values teachers as decision makers and students as curious learners. Discover the path to lifelong professional learning at Heinemann.com. Heinemann is dedicated to teachers. I'm Brett from Heinemann. How do we recognize engagement? Today in the podcast, a special read aloud by author Ellen Oliver Keen from her new book, Engaging Children, Igniting a Drive for Deeper Understanding. Ellen says true engagement often takes us by surprise and is so overpowering we may not recognize it when it happens. Finding the moments when we are engaged, reflecting on them, and sharing them with our students is key to teaching engagement. It is through learning how to recognize our own moments of engagement that we are able to then celebrate and foster engagement in our students. Ellen begins with the story of a student who many teachers will recognize. Ricky was doing his best to be invisible in a room with 14 adults and 21 other sixth graders. He was reading not in a corner created by a filing cabinet and the wall in the furthest reaches of the classroom. I had my eye on him, and occasionally he had his eye on me. I could almost hear him thinking, please don't notice me, please don't notice me, please, please don't ask me to confer with you like you're doing with all those other kids. I conferred with a couple of students and between conferences walked around to observe the students reading or not. Once again, I had my eye on Ricky. Ricky was a pretty skilled fake reader, and he had a couple of other acts going. He was actually recording pages, quote, read, unquote, in a reading log. Yet another reason why reading logs may not be our best option to keep readers accountable. And he stuck a couple of post-its in a page here and there, but wrote nothing on them. He was quiet, disturbed no one, held his book, turned a page, looked around, and moments later turned the page, stuck on another post-it, and on and on it went. Ricky had perfected the fine art of looking engaged. He appeared to be attentive in groups, and while reading independently, he had internalized the secret of blending into the woodwork. I wonder if he has ever read a book. Sound at all familiar? Let's be honest. All of us Adults and children check out sometimes to regain our cognitive bearings or daydream, perhaps to make a list or send a text. We respond to an email we've been avoiding. We force ourselves to move on with a menial task that just must get done. Most of these are healthy distractions. They give us a brain break. And most of us are more than able to resume a task, take the next step, and refocus. We can do so eagerly or begrudgingly, but we step back to the work at hand. Now let's think about, quote, time on task, unquote, an overused term if there ever was one. I remember one of my principals talking about the need to increase students' time on task. If students appeared busy when he walked in, that was time on task. Ricky would have appeared on task to anyone who merely glanced his way. Time on task has become such an overvalued commodity. The term itself is bleached of meaning. As you well know, there are even teacher appraisal processes in which the observer counts the number of students who appear on task at any given time. But clearly, time on task does not equal engagement. And it's important to discern the difference. Time on task is not what this book is about. It's about true engagement, a sensation that is almost intoxicating and far from the superficial attention Ricky was giving to his reading. I have seen too many students like Ricky, and likely you have as well. I realized that it was time to take on the question of what engagement is, what it means to learners, and how we can help Ricky and so many others experience it much more. Engagement, as I'll argue throughout this book, is characterized by a feeling lost in a state that causes us, on one hand, to forget the world around us, to become fully engrossed. On the other hand, when engaged, we enter into a state of wide awakeness that is almost blissful. We want to dig more deeply into our reading or listening or learning or taking action. We allow emotions to roll over us. We are eager to talk with others about an idea. We're even aware of how extraordinary or beautiful those moments are. I wonder if Ricky has ever been engaged. So what's the first step in our work as teachers? 
longing for students to become more engaged more of the time. I'll argue in this book that we need to understand our own engaged experiences, our own engagement stories, as I'll call them. I'll start with one of my own. My family recently returned from a vacation to a lovely Caribbean island in the French West Indies. I'm not accustomed to island vacations. Most of our trips have been to great cities around the world where we can investigate art and history. I've written, in To Understand, of weeping in the Academia Museum in Florence when viewing the four Michelangelo sculptures known as the unfinished slaves. That is the kind of experience I long for when on vacation. I want to return from my vacation changed, my mind filled with indelible images and new understandings. But for this vacation... My very stressed 27-year-old daughter, who will still occasionally travel with her old parents, suggested that we try to relax. So as travel coordinator, I went to work. We had to squeeze six days out of three very busy schedules. Worried that I might become bored with gorgeous beaches and out-of-this-world food, I know, anyone in their right mind would be thrilled with such a vacation like this. I found an island that happens to have one of the world's shortest commercial aircraft runways and is ranked number nine in the top 10 most dangerous airports by today's info.com. Okay, here's something I can get excited about, I thought, and booked the trip. A bit of background might be useful. I have always loved to fly. My father, who was in the Air Force during the Korean War, taught me about airplanes when I was a little girl. We talked and still do for hours about flying, and over the years he helped me understand how something that big stays in the air and what conditions cause it to do so. My dad and I always loved to fly. My mother found it terrifying. When flying as a family, my brother and I had to flip a coin to see who would have to sit next to her on the plane. As she was prone to screaming, we're not gonna stop upon landing, or the wings are coming off when we hit a bumpy patch of air. Really embarrassing. When I started to date my husband, he owned a small plane, but sold it before we got married. I married him anyway, though there are times when I wonder. I fly nearly every week now in my work with schools and districts around the world, and I still book the window seat. For years, though no longer to my great consternation, United Airlines made it possible to listen in on air traffic control, ATC, and cockpit communications, and with time I sorted through all the verbal gibberish until I could understand where my plane was in relation to others. Based on ATC communication, I could even predict when I would see another aircraft out the window and at what heading and altitude it was hurtling through the sky at a staggering 500 knots, around 575 miles per hour ground speed. Work I intended to do on the plane went uncompleted as I tuned in to wind conditions, light chop, mild turbulence, moderate turbulence, severe turbulence, very rare and absolutely safe, and landing patterns. On one of my return flights to Denver, I monitor tower communications. I realized that my aircraft was lining up to land on an active takeoff runway. This was not necessarily a problem. It happens at many airports. But our pilots were actually being told to line up for the parallel runway, 17 left, a nearly 117 degrees left runway, because 17 right was being used for departures. It was one of the few times while flying that I remember feeling my heart pump harder And I mentioned to my seatmate that we were lined up to land on the wrong runway. Shaken, he asked if he could had time to phone his wife, but I had to tell him that we were too close to permit anything like that much time. He asked as if I knew if we were going to crash, and I told him that my guess was that we would execute what is known as a go-around. A go-around is not uncommon. Pilots are directed to pull the nose up, bank hard to get out of the airspace where planes are departing and make a big slow circle to go around and make another try. It happens at O'Hare in Chicago all the time, usually because the plane just ahead failed to taxi off the runway in time. And that's exactly what happened. He looked at me like I was some kind of freak. I reveled in the knowledge that I knew what was going to happen before he did. So much fun. Do you do the same thing when you fly? Booking the island vacation to one of the most dangerous runways in the world, come on, it's 9 out of 10, it's not like we're landing in Nepal or Honduras, seemed a good idea. On the morning of our flight from San Juan, Puerto Rico, our pilots checked us in, took our luggage, drove a bus with the three of us and two other passengers to the side of the plane, loaded our luggage, gave us an extremely brief safety briefing, and told us that we would find wine and beer in the cooler at the back of the cabin. 
I was wild with joy. The cockpit was open to the back of the plane, and when I expressed that being able to look straight ahead while flying was on my bucket list, the guys in the front welcomed me to come up and get as close as I'd like. They told me I could stand or crouch, it was a very small single engine, eight passenger plane, for most of the flight and the descent. They warned me, however, that when they yelled, sit, I should really sit. Okay. The Caribbean from 15,000 feet is nothing short of luminous. In the daylight, it appears as if the sun is coming from under the surface rather than above. Looking forward, new islands popped up on the horizon every few minutes, some with peaks so high it appeared we would graze them. Don't worry, a system on board warns, terrain ahead, terrain ahead, if you're flying a bit too low. Are you just loving this? I know most people don't share this weird obsession. The engine noise was audible, but somehow it felt like we were gliding, with not the slightest bump in the air. I chatted with the pilots who pointed out islands I might know and explained instruments on the panel I couldn't identify. We climbed to a 20,000 feet, more gliding, the softest of right turns. We relaxed into the hour-long flights and the pilots grabbed a beer. I'm kidding. <laughs> or am I? As we descended into St. Bart's, two lushly vegetated peaks arose before us with a deep saddleback between them. The saddleback was still very high, and I could see a traffic circle perched on it with tiny cars whirling around it. I got my first glimpse of the very short runway and the Caribbean immediately beyond. The final drop during which the officer yelled, sit now, I complied felt to me about 1,500 feet. Something like a roller coaster descent, but much, much faster. The airplane came to a very, very quick stop on a 2,100 foot runway, turned 180 degrees, and taxied back to the airport on the same runway it just used to land. The only runway, taxiway. The only way for you to truly appreciate this is to look at the YouTube video. You'll find its link in the book. Notice that the first plane you'll see has to execute a go around. So cool. Buckle up. My husband and daughter grinned at me. Inwardly, I'm sure they were shaking their heads and wondering, along with any and all other sane individuals, what on earth made this experience so important to me. That's just it though, they can't know. I was fully immersed, engaged, in an experience that few would find so captivating. It came from years of casual study, coupled with a sense of awe and a burning desire to go up and do it over and over and over. I stood on the tarmac while the pilots lit up cigarettes a bit close to the fuel tanks for me, but they probably knew what they were doing, and waited to load the next group of passengers' luggage for the flight back to San Juan. I watched another single-engine plane shoot between those peaks, wobbling in a pretty substantial crosswind, put down on that little runway, reverse the engines and apply the brakes, and then turn to taxi in. The pilots finally shooed me out of the way. It turns out I was standing in the parking spot for that aircraft. I could have watched for days. Oh, and we had a lovely six days on beautiful beaches eating great French food. But you should hear about the flight back. I'll stop. Our thanks to Ellen Keene for her read aloud today. We invite you to learn more about her new book, Engaging Children, on Heinemann.com, or you can read blogs, sample chapters, and check out some videos from Ellen at blog.heinemann.com. Ellen is also facilitating a conversation on engaging children through a special Facebook group for readers. To join, check out the link on our blog or search Engaging Children by Ellen Keene on Facebook. We'd love for you to subscribe to the Heinemann Podcast on iTunes and Google Play, where you can also leave a comment or review. We're also now streaming on Spotify, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio, and just about everywhere you can find podcasts. You can also follow Heinemann on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Thanks for listening.